Hey everybody, hopefully you can hear me. Let me know if you can't. Testing audio, one, two, three. Check one, two. Sorry about that. Had a little bit of an audio hiccup playing um, music on my stream, which hey everybody, hopefully. I don't know why that would be the case, uh, but there we go. Uh, we're gonna start here in just a couple minutes. I'm gonna let he people get, get here, arrive. I am just doing some last minute note taking so I can hit everything that I want to hit. Good, I'm glad I'm loud and clear. And uh, if you are tuning in from Patreon, make sure you scroll down and link out, click the link below that will take you directly to the YouTube live stream. Then you can participate in chat. Ah, good. Hope everybody's doing well. We'll start the video in just a sec. Let me know where everybody's tuning in from. Very curious about that. We got 39 people in the audience. Welcome everybody. Again, if you are tuning in from Patreon, make sure you click the link, scroll down to my post below and link out and then you'll be able to participate in the chat. For some reason, Patreon won't let you, if you just use Patreon as your gateway, it won't let you participate in chat. So link out. Nice, I'm gonna start video here, get rid of this overlay. Hey everybody. Hello, let me know in the chat where you guys are tuning in from. Tonight we are going to take a look, or today, I don't know where you're tuning in from, probably many different time zones. We are going to be taking a look at the basic beginning mechanics of claw hammer banjo. This is an opportunity for you guys to ask questions and, and sort of we can, we can discuss things that in depth. I've got some tablature. I've got some diagrams. I've got this diagram. That is not a toe. That's a, that's a fingernail. We'll get to that in a minute. Ah, uh, good, good. Pick is good. Awesome. I got to adjust some things on my end. Uh, I'm just catching up on chat. York, Maine. We got Philadelphia. We've got Charlotte, North Carolina. Australia, can anybody beat Australia? That's a long way from me. <laughs> awesome, San Francisco, Ontario, Canada, Canada, Davenport, Iowa, wow, wow, wow. New Jersey, yes. 
Idaho, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, Troy, New York. Hey, I went to college up uh, in Saratoga Springs. So I that upstate New York area was my stomping grounds for a while. I grew up in Vermont, so right across the state, kind of, from Troy. We got Asheville, North Carolina. Nice, home of some of the finest music in the world, in my opinion. Dublin, Ireland. Nice. Illinois, Southeast Virginia, on the bay. Beautiful. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Collins. I'm a banjo player, and I am here to help you do some banjo basics. Just easy banjo beginning stuff. I want to get you guys some help. I want to show you some basic mechanics. I've got some tablature that we can work through. And uh, five minutes past, that's enough to get banjo players here. I think everybody's here. Let's see, 41 people. Nice. Welcome. New Mexico. Susan's from New Mexico. So this is very much a, I'm going to demo some stuff for you so you can see it and we can think about it. I also want you to think about your questions. I'm going to leave a whole bunch of time towards the end. Heck, you just, if you've got questions, just jump in there. I'm tracking the questions and I'm going to be demoing some stuff and hopefully we can get you squared away. So think about your questions. I'm going to grab a banjo. I happen to have one around here somewhere. Ah, uh, here's one. Ohio, British Columbia. Uh, Nancy says she keeps losing my sound. Can, is that, what, how's it, is everybody having that problem? If everybody's having that problem, please let me know. Nancy, if it's just you, I don't know. That's a weird one. Uh, keep me posted. Let me know how that goes. Uh, this will be left online. So if you need to revisit this and watch it again, and I suspect that'll be useful for many of you. Hopefully the sound will be cool when you rewatch it. Um, I don't know about that. Let's just see. Please let me know if you guys can hear my audio. Um, yeah, and we'll go from there. A lot of people are, the sound is okay for them. Nancy, it might be on your end. Let me know if it persists. Get close to your internet gateway. If you're far away from your router, that can impact you if you're on a wireless device. Okay, good, good, good. I'm monitoring it on my end and it looks, it looks okay. All right, first thing I wanna talk to you guys about, I'm tuned to G by the way, tuned to G. I'm gonna be putting tab up on the screen. Tablature is also available. It's on my Patreon site, but I've made it free for everybody. Um, and you can always download it after the fact. I'm going to leave it up there. I'm typing my Patreon uh, information in the chat. You do not need to be a describer to, subscriber to get tab for this free stream. Luke! Eh? <laughs> How are you, Luke? Tune to G. All right, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about because I think it's so important and easily overlooked is the way you are physically capturing the instrument. I remember when I was first learning, I felt like I was always chasing the banjo. The banjo was kind of wandering around in my lap and I was holding on for dear life. If you feel like that, it means that your hold on the instrument needs some improvement. So I just want to go over those basics right now. For me, usually, most of the time, hey Lisa, most of the time my banjo is in my lap, between my knees, more or less, in the middle of my lap, I'm backing up here, I may go out of focus, hope that's okay. Between my knees, my I'm, I'm a right-hander, my left leg, that means my non-striking hand, my fretting hand foot is often up a little bit, like right now I'm on my tiptoe. I'll put it on a box. If I'm sitting, uh, especially in the beginning, it's super helpful to have the neck side leg up a little bit because look, banjos are naturally neck heavy, right? They wanna go this way. So if I just let that go, it's gonna fall that way. So you've gotta counteract that by a couple of methods. One of my favorite methods is to get the neck side leg up a little bit off the ground. 
The other thing I do, well, I'll get to the other thing I do in a minute because I'll give you the side profile here in a bit. Let's talk about striking arm. This is a big part of the way I capture the instrument. So I'm over the instrument. I'm locking in with my forearm on the rim of the banjo. And I like to think of this rim portion as a fulcrum because I'm using it to rock my motion in and out of the instrument. That's one of my most positive points of contact on the banjo. So I'm in my lap forearm on the fulcrum and I'm pulling in and down lightly, lightly. Don't do this too hard. Don't make yourself miserable. Pull it in, put a little bit of weight, let gravity kind of hold you down on the rim of the banjo. And then I also lean the banjo into my ribs. So I'm sort of capturing it with three points of contact. It looks like uh, Nancy's audio got fixed. Awesome, Nancy, I'm so happy. That's good. So to back up, look, three points of contact. Legs, forearm on fulcrum, and ribs, ribs. I know, it's weird. But I'm using my ribs to uh, capture it. And then I'm at a point, I'm also, you remember, I'm elevating that left foot just a bit. Now I'm at a point where if I start to generate some patterns with my right hand, the banjo is locked. It don't, it, it doesn't need any support from my left hand, nothing. It's locked. Watch the, one of the things in private lessons I do is when a player is playing, I watch their headstock. Because if the headstock is looking like this, when they're playing, <laughs> I see this with beginners all the time. It's like this move, it's like this crazy little dance that the headstock is doing. It's a nice little tip for you. If you look up at that headstock and it's like all over the place, you know that you've got a problem down here that you need to sort. I'm always looking for upstream, you know, upstream solutions to downstream problems. You don't want the headstock moving, right? Because if you've got a moving banjo, it's like archery or something. If, if you're tar or golf, if the hole moves, it makes a very difficult sport even more difficult. Same for banjo. This becomes a really hard sport if this guy is all over the map. So lock in. And the last little bit that is really easy not to, uh, to, to sort of overlook is or to misinterpret on a camera. This camera is giving you a two-dimensional image of me. It looks like this banjo is square to me and the floor and my body and all that. It's not. And here's what you can't see in a video very often. I kick the instrument out and back. So if it were square, it would look like this. I don't do that. I tow it forward on my left leg neck side leg, towing it forward. I open it back towards me and a little bit up to the ceiling and out. This does a couple things. First of all, it's more ergonomic, like it's not some square thing that I have to kind of reach over and contend with. It's tilted back towards me, which makes this arm nice and it's just so comfortable. It also lets all that tone free out of the instrument. If I'm blocking it with my body, that my body's gonna swallow the tone. Sometimes that can be a good thing if your banjo is too ringy or if you're getting a lot of overtones, maybe you want that. But I like to tow it out, to open that banjo up to the room and get a more full sound. So that's how I interact with the banjo with the right hand. The left hand, my fretting hand, some of you guys may be lefties, righties, it doesn't matter, whatever your fretting hand is. My fretting hand doesn't do much other than fret. It's not really there to hold the instrument. This kind of looks like a holder of some kind. It's not, it's just there to fret. That's its pretty much its sole job. I will say that I do, it is because I'm kind of, I'm very active in my hold. Uh, it does serve as a source of just 
making things a little bit still and a little bit more contained. So I will say that, but I'm not holding the instrument. I'm certainly not holding it off the ground. This is what I see in beginning lessons. The, the, They'll play, they'll play, they'll play in this the banjo neck will tune. And every five minutes, oh, they have to get, no, it'll sink, it'll sink, it'll sink. No, they got a bit. You don't want to be doing that. You want this banjo to be locked in. Another little tip. Use the brackets. These brackets are awesome. They not only look super cool, but they help you. Can You can kind of use them to lock into your leg. So use those brackets as a sort of source of friction against the constant roll that your banjo is going to want to do. Oh, wow. I have, uh, this is an interesting comment that I have to... That's awesome. Left prosthetic leg, just the stool. It helps already. That is awesome. That is awesome. Glad that helps you. I wonder if you could make some holder. Some there, I, I there are some things that you can put over your leg to help uh, grip. Um, so the classical guitarists use them. I don't use those, but they're out there. Anyway, you shouldn't need a product unless something's up with um, your ability to hold the banjo. Um, you probably shouldn't need a product. Some people I have taught over the years do find that a strap helps. For me, a strap is for when I stand with the with the banjo and not when I'm sitting. I want my hold to be good enough. It I think of it like a weld, like I'm welding to the instrument. If that helps you. I've done uh, in the past I've done a bit of clay pigeon shooting and they teach you the weld on the on the shotgun can makes a huge difference in how you get your pigeons, uh, the, the clay, the little clay discs. Um, and I think of that when I'm playing banjo a little bit, like just get, getting a weld on the instrument so that it is, it feels like it's not going anywhere. Awesome, William. Yeah, this this little thing can really help you. These little things add up, guys, and that's why a, this live stream, this is why it's here for you, is these little things make such a big difference. If you're fighting at this stage, if you can't hold the banjo well, we've got to figure out a way to hold it, that you can hold it so it doesn't move. Otherwise, you, you're making the mountain unnecessarily steep. Now, the last thing I'll say about the hold, and uh, the, the, the last thing I'll say about the hold is there are many ways to do this right. This is the way that I've discovered that works really well for me, and I wanna just pass that on to you, but everybody's built a little bit differently. Some of us different length arm, different length leg. Some of us have prosthetics that we have to use and work around and, Whatever method you can come up with that gives you the weld and gives you comfort is fine. So if you find that what for whatever reason your physiological makeup requires you to do something different, there are lots and lots of ways to do this correctly. So think your way through the problem. The goal is you want a banjo that is still and doesn't require fretting hand support. That's our goal. And these are all the variables that I use to achieve that goal, plus the little added kick out for tone and comfort. So think about the ways you hold and see if you can adjust. All right, let's talk about the right hand mechanics of claw hammer banjo. So uh, if you have, it, we'll talk more about the left hand in a bit, but I wanna talk about what's going on with this guy or the striking hand. For me, claw hammer banjo is first and foremost percussion. Percussion. It's a drum. It's a drum. It even looks like a drum, right? Like that's totally a drum. I've had snare drums that look very similar to that. I can just get rid of the neck and it looks almost looks like I'm holding a snare drum. I and it's not just because I'm a former drummer. I really feel like my best mechanics were awakened when I stopped thinking about this instrument as a stringed instrument and started thinking about it as an instrument to strike, to hit. 
banjo, it's a claw hammer banjo becomes really easy when you let the velocity of your hand sail through the strings and strike the strings. It's, it, I wish you could feel it. Um, the, the goal for you as beginners would be to have that feeling every once in a while. Hopefully you'll get a glimpse of that. Every, every couple practice sessions, it'll, it'll feel easy. It's those moments that are very precious because it means that your technique and, and all your mechanics are just lining up perfectly. As beginners, your job is to seek out those moments where it's just like, oh, wait a minute, I, I think that's it. And then you'll lose it and you'll sleep on it and you'll have to come back up to it at another time. Just like me, just like I did in the beginning. I, uh, this took me a while to learn too. So you, you're looking for these moments of ease ease so we're gonna let that we're gonna let that claw hammer stroke be easy i want the my favorite analogy for claw hammer the one that i think you can walk away with tonight and really think about over the next couple weeks is knocking on a door so if we imagine a door here i've got a door right here this is my door if we've got a door yep you can see that right so i've got a flat surface of a door and if i walk up to that door I knock straight in. The wrist kind of, it, it kind of breaks into that door a little bit, breaks, and then I extract straight out. The wrist kind of flows with me. I'm not angrily knocking. This is not an angry knock. This is a gentle, pleasant knock. So I've got my door. I throw in, let the wrist break. Then I back it off. The wrist flops open. And again, send it. Send it. There is no lateral movement to a knock. I wouldn't knock like this. There's no rotational movement to a knock. That would be strange to knock on a door like this. That would be, feel a little bit unnatural. So this is why I love this analogy for claw hammer banjo. It gets you operating straight into the instrument and straight out of the instrument on the upstroke. So now let's turn this guy over and see how that works in practice. I'm gonna give you a couple different views here. This is called a double thumbing pattern. I'm just gonna do a downstroke with the back of my striking nail on the first string and an upstroke with my thumb on the fifth string. We'll talk about nail stuff and striking in just a second, but I want you to see the knock activated from the fulcrum. So I'm gonna go nice and slow, throw in, Engage fist string and then out. Talk about that in detail in a second. Throw in, out. Add some speed. Tune the banjo. More speed. More speed. One more step up. One, two, three. Straight in, engage the fist string, straight out. Okay, let's talk about striking nail. Somebody asked that on Patreon a couple days ago. I drew a diagram. I, I tried to get one of my daughters who are really good artists to draw this. And they were like, Dad, you're on your own. <laughs> so I'm just going to apologize right now. This is terrible. I'm just going to darken it up a little bit. We're going to talk about fingernails and how and what part of the nail strikes the string. Uh, I'm just making this dark. Uh, because I think this is really important and it's, it's very easily overlooked. Okay, ready for this? Ready for my art? Oh God, this is gonna be terrible. William, I'll answer you in just a sec. This is not a toe. <laughs> this is a fingernail. So if you were to hold your hand up like we're giving each other high five and you look at your striking nail, I want you to think of your striking nail as a clock face because that can help me talk you through 
where I strike on the nail. Notice the nail here is squarish. I get way better mileage out of a square trimmed striking nail than I do out of anything pointy because I actually use more art for you. This is, I use my 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock corner of my nail if my nail is facing me like this and the clock is noon, I use that corner, the corner on the fifth string side of my nail to strike the strings. This is why I'm not an artist. But hopefully this gets your, the, the, the idea across. Now, there are players, some world-class, amazing, wonderful players who play it on this corner. They rotate their hand open. And I get a slightly, when I do that, it softens the tone just a little bit. Uh, but I don't play it on that side unless I want to get really quiet. Sometimes I'll use that for like a recording or something. But most of the time I'm in on the 10, 11 o'clock corner of that nail, corner towards the fifth string. Just getting the corner of the string to tag that, just getting the corner of the nail to tag that string as I throw, throw, throw into the banjo. Remember, this is a throw, not a push. Don't push, don't open. Keep your hand nice and closed. A reasonable little bit amount of tension is good here. And I activate, throw, corner of the nail, plunge through the string to a target beyond, which happens to be the head on the fist string. So again, throw, throw, throw. Let that let that hand kind of go through the strings and land on the head like a ton of bricks. And then we've got to talk about the fifth string, the upstroke, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Experiment with that. I'm going to catch up on chat. If you have corners, uh, questions. Look, this is what happens when you're trying to read a chat and uh, talk about banjo at the same time. If you have questions, leave them. Let me answer them for you. Uh, let's just, let's see. Hey, a banjo teacher in the audience. Hey, banjo boy. <laughs> Glad to be of help. Let me scroll down. Um, yeah, that, that moving headstock, it's a super cool way to just instantly get some information about your students. I think of myself when I'm giving a lesson as a banjo detective. Tom Collins, banjo detective, because I'm I'm looking to help people solve problems and I need clues. And sometimes the clues are super not obvious. Sometimes you really have to dig. That's one of my favorite ones. That's a big sign that something about the hold is not happening. Uh, let's see. Are you? This is a first technique question. Get your technique questions in, guys. Now's a good time. Are you keeping the muscle behind the thumb off of the fist string, William? William, I don't understand that question. Are you keeping the muscle behind the thumb? Oh, oh, this is a really good question. I think I know what you're talking about, William. Are you talking about like this big hunk of meat here? Uh, this has come up in some lessons, uh, in some private lessons lately. So this is weird. For my hands, uh, when I'm going slow, my thumb meat, we're gonna call that, that's a technical word for this part of your hand. Um, my thumb meat contacts the fist string. And it's interesting, because that really gets me pretty close to the head there. See that? I'm still got a slight bend in the wrist. And this gets us to a really important discussion and thing that I think any musician wants, and that is neutral positions. It's the way you avoid injury. So for example, if I back up here and I just let my arms, my arms are grotesquely long, 
Sorry about that. <laughs> kind of strange. They scrape on the ground when I walk. That's all right. My, my, your, your arms and, and hands, when they're relaxed at your side, do that with me. Put your arms down at your side. Relax them. Let the tension go. Take a deep breath. <sighs> and you pick them up without jacking them all up you're gonna find that they're in they should be in these nice neutral gently curved shapes well check this out if i if i do that relax take a deep breath hit the reset button and then without screwing my arms up too much pick them up and put them on the banjo in the right position look at the neutral shape neutral 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 not this not this this is so bad i see this a lot you don't want that you guitarists do this a lot, don't do that. Nice, neutral, slight bend in the wrist. Arm is not out like this, like some weird chicken. It's down, it's nice and close to the body. This arm is wrapped over, neutral shape. Thumb in, but there is air between the wrist. That's impossible to show you guys. There's air between the wrist and the banjo head, so even though my thumb may be fairly in line with that string, my wrist is, see, I can see you, hi. There's air between my wrist and the banjo head. I can look clear down and see the bridge. If you have a, if your wrist is tied, look, this breaks our neutral shape rule, right? Because my wrist is now tied to the head. I see this a lot in beginners. They're operating like this. It looks like they're, it's so hard. It looks like it's so difficult to play the banjo. To me, this is a not an optimal way to do things. I'm open, 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 neutral, neutral shape. So the remember, uh, I mentioned that holding the banjo and interacting with the banjo it's a little bit different for everybody, but you all want the same ideas, right? The goal of your hold is to weld the instrument to your body so it's not a moving target. The goal of good mechanics is so that the playing of the instrument is absolutely super easy. It's effortless. You don't want anybody saying when you play the banjo, whoa, that dude makes it look really hard to play the banjo. No, you want somebody to say, wow, she makes it look like it's the easiest thing in the world. So that's that's the goal behind these mechanics. Ease, efficiency, comfort. These all flow from neutral shapes on the neck, neutral shapes on the banjo pot, not these crazy jacked up positions with the shoulders up and the wrist flat and the thing. You like you don't want that. You want ease, ease, keep everything relatively neutral. Um, let's see. Ryan Harlan is in the audience. Oh, whoops. Wait. In palm reading, apparently that area is cold. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan, for setting us all straight. There will be palm reading later in the episode. Uh, but actually, Ryan says he's fast on the... Ryan is fast on the Google, so don't mess with Ryan. The uh, Thanar Eminence, that's a good band name, but it would have to be like metal banjo. So if I start like a thrash metal banjo band, I'm going it, to, it, it, it's at least the name of the first album. <laughs> and Dustin, he's Googling the answers. Dustin? Googling. Ryan would Google. He's too fast for Google. They've had to invent an entire new <laughs> search engine for Ryan <laughs> called Google. Anyway. You know, Bob, I like this. I like this because this, this goes into the idea where you're looking for solutions to problems upstream. And I I really like this because it it it's... Talking about the core, your core stability. And, it, you know, people may laugh about this, but it really helps if you're balanced and and your core is stable. It, it especially in the beginning, helps you guys 
get around holding this weird object in your lap and interacting with it in a positive, efficient way. So I do think this idea of stabilizing yourself is really helpful in the beginning. Now, let me just, um, let me just, uh, banjo confessions, banjo confessions. I feel like I need some like syrupy strings and some cursive banjo confessions. I don't play like this all the time. I like to sit, I got my, I got my little chair back there. I like to just kick back, you know, I like to do this. I like, to, I love to play like this. So here's the deal with all, all this stuff. These are really useful ways to get a hold of the beginning stages of banjo, but when you're into it and, and you can hold the banjo comfortably, you're gonna find that a lot of these rules you don't need them so much anymore. You can kind of let them go and you're gonna be able to, to really weld to the banjo in almost any position. Like here I am, my leg is crossed. This is my other way to, favorite way to play the banjo. My banjo is kind of on my hip. I shove the banjo into my armpit. <laughs> it's the armpit method of banjo playing. <laughs> Jeez. And I'm fine. <laughs> is parallel to the floor. It's fine, doesn't need to be up. So this is all to say that um, in the beginning of your banjo journey, there are a lot of useful rules that you need to pay attention to. But once you start getting comfortable, the rules you can kind of slacken on a little bit as, la as, as, as long as your playing is good and efficient and tuneful and musical, then you can let some of these ideas fall by the wayside. So I'm saying that not to confuse you, but so that you know that when you, in your banjo journey, you don't have to feel like you've got to sit in this proper way the whole time. That's not necessarily what banjo is about long term it's just useful in the beginning what do you think of that hopefully that helps keep firing your questions i'm seeing them i'm seeing them uh let's go back to the nail discussion rick he needs a longer nail right now i strike the nail but then my fingertip hits the string immediately afterwards uh rick i see this a lot my nail is not all that long. I can't show it to you because I'll go out of focus. Um, it's, how long is it? It's, uh, I don't know. It's, gosh, a millimeter over my the end of my uh, pad of my finger, maybe? I don't know. I'm in America and we don't do metric system very well, so I... Yeah, millimeter. Uh, no, a couple millimeters. Millimeters are small, right? Luke will. Luke can tell me. <laughs> millimeters are small, right? Yeah. So a couple of a couple of millimeters. It's just not very far. It's just not very far. So um, that may have to do. One thing I notice with a lot of players is in the beginning, their their uh, striking finger is too far out. I hope you guys can see that. It's a little dark in the studio this evening. So that's going to put your pad more in line with the strings and you probably tag that string on your way through if you keep your nail parallel with the head and just hit it with the corner you're gonna sail right through without that pad having much of a connection with the string as you pass through the string thank you chris yes so uh, yeah 16th of an inch I'm probably a 16th over sometimes I have it longer sometimes I break my nail just like everybody else when I'm doing it boy dishes I do dishes and then I it, it just kills me <laughs> and uh, banjo banjo complaints right um and I break my nails all the time I do find when my nail gets short I still pretty much can get the tone I like I don't it's it's not too bad uh, and again, that corner comes in handy. The corner is also stronger. So I feel like I get a much bolder tone when I'm using the corner of the nail. Anyway, my I run my striking nail parallel to that head, not out. 
and not tucked in parallel parallel so when i push through when i strike through that first string and collide with the head it's landing flat on that head these angles are not helping you at all are they uh they're giving you some idea flat on that head uh let's scroll up oh but was yeah luke's getting into banjo confessions Many, uh, many do, many do. Luke, it's okay, it's okay. Chime in if you use a fake nail. Ryan, Ryan's gone down the rabbit hole on the fake nail. Uh, let's see, um, Dustin, I imagined your neck on your body being parallel to the floor like you had horrible posture. I imagine your neck on your body being, oh gosh, I don't know what that means. Try again, Dustin. I'm confused. Uh, just Dustin says again, uh, I'm trying to develop a natural nail sound so I can uh, develop skill in the banjo without sounding... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, natural is good, but, you know, I know a lot of players who play with fake nails and picks, and you would never know it. They sound like a million bucks. So um, just because I use a natural nail doesn't mean that you have to. There are a lot of folks I teach who have all kinds of nail issues. Thin nails, whatever. Don't have nails, whatever. It's always, you can always come up with a great solution to work around that issue. Picks work really well for some people I've seen play. Fake nails work incredibly well for some players I've seen. So don't let nail struggles slow you down. Find a solution, don't obsess over it too much. I know it's easy to go down the rabbit hole on this stuff. But you can also think back to banjo history. Just imagine people playing the banjo throughout history. A lot of those folks who made banjo famous and beautiful were also people who worked with their hands daily and probably could not keep or maintain a delicate little precious nail like us modern banjo players can because they had to work with their hands. And, and, and so they, made the, they were able to make do. So I'm a firm believer in pay attention to it. Work through the details. Work with your limitations and strengths. You can find a solution to make this work for you. All right. Sean is in the audience. Hey, Sean. Better late than never. I feel like this too. Lisa, if I let my nail get too long, it messes me up. Uh, I also bruise the nail bed if I let it get too long because it, I don't know, it like messes with me. It, it, it puts too much pressure or, or something. It acts as a lever against my, my finger. I don't know, I get bruised. Um, not visibly, but like it gets sore. So I have to keep my nail at a certain range but I'm, I'm not super fussy about it either. I just sort of do it and it works. Um, the hand cream I use can see. Um, yeah, the hand, I do use, I do moisturize. <laughs> Didn't I just say I don't fuss over it too much? I really don't. But I do moisturize in the winter, man, because if I don't, this gets super brittle and then it's another moving target. I'll wake up, I'll break it. You don't want moving targets. You want to try to keep your variables relatively similar day to day. It's true in the beginning. Uh, it's true now, especially if I want to record and get a consistent recording sound from day to day. I do use a product. I'm not affiliated with it in any way. But the name of the cream I use is called Waleda, W-A-L-E-D-A, -E Skin Food. And if Waleda would like to sponsor Banjo Quest, hi Waleda, I love you guys. They're amazing. I discovered it through my family who are all fastidious about uh, skin care and know all the, the how to do it. So I do use that stuff. It, it's amazing. Fantastic. Run out and get it. I use the light Waleda skin food. Awesome. It smells good too. Um, anyway. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lindsay from Quail Creek Banjos. 
which you should Google if you haven't checked out Lindsay's beautiful banjos. Uh, the longer he plays, the less important the nail is to an extent. That is exactly my experience. The longer I play, the less of a deal it is. In the beginning, it felt like it was every everywhere. No worries, Dustin. Um, I'm just making sure I get everybody's question in. I'll try to come back to that other one that you left, Dustin. Keep asking them. Keep asking them. Uh, we've got 62 people in the audience. So I'm just trying to spread the love a little bit. Um, this is a really good question. I use my middle nail for everything. Every downstroke I make on the instrument is exactly the same. I do not use two nails. There are some players who alternate or use a different nail according to a string. I don't do that. Uh, and while I recognize that that is a technique, I encourage people to keep it simple. Keep it simple. There's Because claw hammer is a binary stroke, that means you throw in, you've got a throw and you've got a catch or an upstroke. You got a throw and a catch. It's all there is to it. There is no, to my mind, there is no advantage to alternating, alternating downstroke fingers because you're only ever downstroking once. So I see no advantage. In fact, I, if a student comes to me, eh, I try to unwind that because I see for the most part, with there are some exceptions, there are always some exceptions to this. There are world-class players who alternate fingers. There are, they're amazingly wonderful players. But in the beginning for me, that is... It's just another variable you have to contend with. And I just advocate for simplicity, simplicity in your strokes, simplicity in your mechanics, simplicity in the arrangements and the tabs and the tunes that you're playing. Simple, simple, simple until you get all the mechanics right. And then you can start teasing out the complexity. That's just my, that's my very biased opinion. Ah, uh. <laughs> yes, this is a phenomenon, Rod. If you find yourself drooling while playing banjo, this is a heightened banjo state. Many people outside the banjo world will tell you if you drool and play the banjo, it's a bad thing. But to me, that is when you've that is when you're onto it, man. So if you got the drool, you're playing, you're in the zone. It's, it's it is the finest state a banjo player can reach. <laughs> you guys are fun. I'm getting I'm getting distracted by these lovely comments. Yes, I love Seinfeld. Paul. Paul from Seville, Spain where I plow a lonely claw hammer furrow. Paul, you are not alone. You are with us tonight. I'm with you. Uh there, you know, it claw hammer is this funny thing even in the states i think a lot of my students will be playing for a little while in the beginning and they'll be like this is hard <laughs> this is hard to really get right and my response always is how many people do you know who play claw hammer banjo and almost every one of those people who are just starting out on the instruments even in the states they say zero nobody so even here, we can, us claw hammer players, we gotta stick together. We can feel a little bit lonely. So I am, I'm with you. I'm with you, Paul, right now. Uh, somewhere I read a, yes, yes, I, I do, I, I, guilty, guilty. I wear rubber gloves. I wear work gloves all the time when I'm outside working. I'm a prima donna, I am, with my nails, I admit it. I admit it, but it's for a good cause. And I go back to Lindsay's comment, even though I am very protective of my nail and my daily uh, running throughout my day, it, it I can break a nail and still be fine. It's just, I'd, I think it's almost like superstition at this point. <laughs> um, and Don says biotin helps. Uh, I have heard this helps, but your mileage may vary. Uh, let's see. Aiken Ritchie is saying, slowly finding personal nail length sweet spot 
Shout out to shortly after getting my banjo when I trim my nails like normal. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this goes along with us uh, in the theme that in the beginning, the nail feels like it's everything. In the intermediate to advanced stages of claw hammer playing, which you will achieve if you just keep working at it, it becomes less and less of a big deal. Ah, uh, Paul is asking, how important do you feel the scooped neck is? In the beginning, Paul, I wouldn't worry about it. These good time banjos are fantastic for learning on. They are really wonderful. I've taught people on good times for, for so long. They're fantastic. During change the banjo game when they came out with the good time, don't feel like you need to run out and scoop it. That said, if I'm buying a banjo, new it, it, it will have a scoop every time because of that bubbly warm rich tone that i get it's like having two banjos in one the further away i can get from that bridge the 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 warmer the tone gets i've been slinging this banjo all around and it's unhappy it's out of tune versus do that again. So, scoop is super cool. If you get if you ever upgrade your instrument in the future, get one. I I love the scoop. I I'll always have one. But I will say to get the to maximize your good time, getting as far away from that bridge as possible, like right up, like get your thumb so when you do your downstroke, it's just tagging that uh, tension hoop just a little bit. This neck joint right here is like the, it's banjo heaven right there. Even though I play a lot over the scoop, right there you still can get an amazing tone. There's a harmonic node in that area. You get a rich tone there. So get as close to that as you can on your good time and uh, you should that, that will help you. Yeah, that's my thought on the scoop. I like the scoop. Um, yeah, okay, Sean's gonna, I think a lot of people are going to say, yep, that's me, have to have it for my profession, have to have short nails for my profession, and everything else is a compromise to that, it's fine, the compromise can be beautiful, so I don't feel like you can't make something absolutely breathtaking with the instrument if you can't grow a real nail, I, lots of folks can't and you can make it work. Sean, that pick will feel more a part of you the longer you play. A lot of questions, a lot of questions, good. Mike, how many different tunings do you plan and should we memorize? Uh, okay, I think there are two, three big tunings for any beginning banjo player and I think you should hit them all. G, standard G, sawmill, and double C. If you don't know what those are, Google them, Google them, and uh, that'll lead you to the tuning and just do like double C chord chart or sawmill chord chart or G standard banjo chord chart. You'll get the chord charts, it's really easy to find online. Those are the three tunings that I think are essential to a beginning banjo player. There's a lot to learn on this fretboard. Look at how many frets there are. There are a lot of frets, there are a lot of strings, there are a lot of different combinations you can make with notes. Don't worry about that stuff as a beginner. Your job as a beginner, 90% of your work, in my opinion, should be on your right, your striking hand mechanics. For those lefties out there, I wanna include you guys. Your striking hand mechanics are everything. Your ability to keep time, those are the things that are more important than learning chords and all their inversions or scales or any of that stuff, that stuff is important and it becomes increasingly important in your banjo journey as you spend more time with the instrument. But just your basic mechanics with your right hand, are your, you can make some incredible, incredible sounding uh, tunes and arrangements with just a very basic understanding of what's going on up here. Amazing thing about Clawhammer is that it has a lot of amazing qualities, but you can, it doesn't take much fretting hand stuff, moves, 
to make incredibly beautiful music. It can be dead simple, left-handed wise. The right hand, if it's solid, if you're keeping good time, if your tone is good and your mechanics are efficient and smooth, you're you're like you're you're in a good spot. Let this be. Let this be the pursuit that you tackle a little bit later. That said, <laughs> standard G, sawmill, double C. Those three tunings are the ones you need to spend your time in. And there are lots of tunings. Uh, we do a bunch on banjo quest. Some really obscure ones. They're worlds unto themselves. They're well worth pursuing. They can teach you a lot about music. They can open up tones and intervals and sounds, textures that you might not find in these other tunings. But don't worry about them in the beginning. Grab those three tunings and, and that, will, that will be good for you for a long time. Wow, somebody is tuning in from Poland. Jacob is tuning in from Poland. Hey there, Jacob, welcome. Oh, scrolling down, da da, ooh, yeah. Yes, yes, that's a lovely thought for everybody out there, including you lonely claw hammer players who feel like you're the only one in the world. You're not, but we're rare. We're a rare breed. Um, all right, I'm going to demo some things real quick. There is a ton. There are more questions here. We have 78 people, 78 lovely people out there. Thank you for joining us. Let me throw some things on the screen because there's some beginning claw hammer things that I want you guys to, I want to leave, I, I want to put on the screen for, for you. Um, that was kind of a redundant way to put that, but that's okay. <laughs> Look at this. This is, this is uh, fun. It's amazing what we can do with these live streams. I'm going to scoot myself over just a little bit. So look at that. This is tablature. Tablature, although it is much maligned these days, is an amazing tool. Please, please use it. It is so useful. Not only is it a useful way to sort of get to, to communicate banjo ideas, but it is also a really useful way to visualize the eighth note grid. Remember I was talking about getting the right hand to do its thing and to be really, really good at that thing? Timing is such a big part of that. Timekeeping, it's sort of my crown jewel of, of uh, musicianhood. Everything flows from that one crown jewel, timekeeping. And if you can have a way convenient, easy way to visualize the grid that you're playing within, this eighth note grid, we'll talk about it in just a second, your playing is going to be cleaner, crisper, and more musically delicious. <laughs> For lack of a better, I don't know. I don't know, I guess it's getting near dinner time here. It's five o'clock, getting hungry. <laughs> musically delicious. So. How to read tab? Well, tab is a physical representation of the strings on the banjo. If I start here, down below, I'm gonna touch that string. That is your fist string. That is a, this is a map of your banjo. That line at the bottom is your fifth string. That's the short string. Fourth, third, second, and first. So this pattern is a First string, fifth string, first string, fifth string, first string, fifth string, fourth string, first string, fifth string, say that five times fast, pattern of eight notes. I'm gonna play that for you now, I've already done it, but I'm gonna do it again, starting there. One, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and, that's all that is. Good to be able to count and play at the same time. Every downstroke gets a number. Every thumb stroke gets an and. One and two and three and four and. One and two and three and four and. Why is it important to count? Well, that can crystallize the grid for you. If you know that every time a number is counted, you're doing a downstroke, and you know that every and is counted means that you're doing an upstroke, it's a very convenient way and very neat way to think about this grid. 
One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and if you are playing with a metronome, and I know we had this question over on Patreon, so I just want to do that real quick. I'm not checking my email. I'm actually getting a metronome. I love this Time Trainer metronome for iPhone. If I set that at 100 beats per minute, 100 BPM, every click is a downstroke. It's a number, and every space between the click is an upstroke. So I'll play that one, two, three, Four, one and two and three and four and that's for you, Eric. We'll go be going into more depth. I know Eric wrote that question on Patreon. Uh, we'll be going into more depth in another beginner session. So uh, let me play that whole line for you. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Again, without me counting, one, two, three, four. Again. This pattern, it's all eighth notes. It's called a double thumbing pattern. It simply means a thumb is following every downstroke. The thumb stroke is following every single downstroke. Questions, questions. I'm gonna, hey, Tony Thomas is in the audience. Tony, I'm gonna email you this weekend. We need to do some more live streams if you're up for it. Hi, Tony, <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Yes, Banjo did go to nail salons pre-COVID, ugh. Uh, I'm just, look, I'm scrolling back. Um, oh, I'm getting, getting blowed up here. Let me shut that off. Uh, I'm throwing some, I, I can't throw everybody up on the screen. I'm just getting the ones that are interesting. That could help. Let's, uh, let's look that up. Somebody look that up. That's cool. Gina Health Hoof Products when used to play classical, classical guitar. Okay. Yeah, there are some. I don't know, but I mean, I don't know. I haven't taken any of this stuff. I, but I do, I, I actually have pretty hard, durable nails. So I have, haven't felt the need. Um, but you guys may want to look into some of this stuff for you. Uh, do, 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 do. We're going to have to, I'm going to have to wrap up fairly soon. So get your questions in. I'm going to do these more. We have 76 people. What if we did this once a month? sort of a beginner's live stream corner. I was thinking that if we had a decent turnout, we could maybe do this uh, regularly because I think it's important to answer questions and get you guys some help on this stuff. Uh, da -da -da, I'm just scrolling. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Missing the open string showing first fret, but not, oh, do, do. I don't know that. Um, I'm not sure about that. You missing the open string. Mm. No, I'm in G tuning. I don't know if that helps you. Ha! Huh. For those of you who don't know, Tony is a historian and uh, scholar of the banjo. So that is incredible. I didn't know. So that was called thimble playing. Entertainer used banjo thimbles. Tony, were they round or did they have an edge? Tony goes on to say, Joel Hooks makes... Oh, there we go. Awesome. Tony, that's amazing. What the heck? I had no idea. Look that up, folks. <laughs> I'm just reading chat, guys. You are so welcome, Rod. I'm so happy that this helps. These little things, man, they are so easy to overlook and you don't find them in books. They're, it, it's hard to, 
Hard to suss this stuff out. Clawhammer's idiosyncratic for so many reasons and these little details can, can really help you. I'm so helpful. I am so thankful that you said that. I'm, I'm glad it's helpful. Uh, right, everybody is in. Uh, or not everybody. Some of you are interested in a repeating beginner's workshop. Awesome. I'm going to make that happen. Everybody thinks that's a good idea or, yeah, beginner roundup. Uh, <laughs> I know John. John is a fellow motorcycle enthusiast. He has many years on me in riding. I'm a noob rider compared to John. Uh, we have together found many, many commonalities between motorcycling <laughs> and banjoing, and we will discuss them in future episodes. I'm sure they will come up because I cannot escape them. Uh, okay, this is good because this segues into the, uh, this segues into stuff that I've got on the fire or irons in the fire that some of you may be interested in. Uh, I am leading a boot camp. My next boot camp starts on Monday. Monday, the infinite waltz starts on Monday. It will, the first one will be broadcast live. The schedule will be going live later this evening, I think on Patreon. It's mostly a paid thing. So it's one of the perks of being one of my subscribers at the captain $5 level a month and over on Patreon. This workshop, which I failed to mention in the beginning like an idiot because I was so distracted, easily distracted. This workshop is simply not possible if it weren't for my amazing community of patrons over on Banjo Quest. Uh, they keep the lights on. I would not be able to do this. I would have to just do private lessons they enable things like this, free workshops that will remain free. If you want to support what I do, if you want to join them and the amazing community that we've created, I'm just going to leave this on there, patreon.com. It is awesome, well worth it, and a, a very small amount of my t material gets released these days to YouTube. You guys just see a very small portion of it. Um, so if you want more multiple videos a week, tablature, including tablature for tonight, though that's free, go to Patreon and check it out. It is well worth it, I think. And I, I thank my patrons. I couldn't do this without them. They are amazing uh, folks who love this stuff. Keep keep me going. Uh, do, do Just catching up on chat. Uh, Dustin, quickly, Dustin, type your question again. Type your question really just as clear as possible in the chat so I don't have to scroll and find you again and I'll try to answer it right now. We're gonna close out in the next five minutes. Um, cool, I, yeah, these banjo thimbles. That's the, I'm gotta look these up, this is amazing. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the second string. This is where stuff gets a little wild on the banjo, right? Because we can't sail through like we can on the first string. So instead, and this will be a topic for next time, I'm gonna be doing these once a month. So uh, the other thing you can do, if you don't wanna do the Patreon thing, I totally get it. If you just subscribe to my YouTube channel, just do that, it's totally free, you'll be alerted and my channel will get a little bump. So you can always do that if that would uh, be easier for you. We're gonna be talking about inner strings next time. The quick of it is you hit that second string, you sail through the second string and you let the first string kind of catch your motion. Don't go past the first string. So you strike the second string, impact the first, and then you perform your upstroke. Inner strings are really tricky. You'll get confidence on the first string and then you'll try the inner strings and you'll be like, oh man, this is so much harder than I thought. It's all possible. You just have to think your way through it, take your time, use the basic principles that you're using on the first string, apply them to the inner strings and maybe attend my next free live stream and we can get you squared away. Uh, but I've got to regularly, please, will do. 
Oh, I am in. Someday. I would love that. You know, I took seven years of Russian in high school and then in college. Don't ask. I, I still, I'm terrible with languages. I find Russian, though, to be one of the most beautiful on the planet. I, I don't mind saying that. Y'all have a lovely, lovely language. I would love to visit Russia someday. Someday I will, and I'll bring my banjo. Ah, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, just whatever. I go. I also have. Um, I I also sell T-shirts for banjos, and there's this one, and there's that one. If you guys wanna, I know I sound like I sound like a used car salesman, but I I you know I do this, I do this for a living, so I get to. You can get t-shirts, the most amazing banjo teachers, t-shirts, I think. You can get them at teespring.com slash banjo quest, something like that. What is my store? I should have organized this, but I didn't. I always forget to. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> I appreciate it, Sean. Uh, what are your current regarding pot size? Oh, gosh. I love... Any size pot, I, I this is a 12 inch. 12 inch pots are bassy and, and they're good on the low end. 11 inch pots are focused and they, they're, they're, uh, they're crystalline in their delivery of tone. They're also comfortable according to your body type. You may find that a smaller pot just suits your body size better. I don't care these days. I don't care much about pot size. I don't get, I used to get hung up on that. I don't think about it much. Banjo either sounds good or it needs tweaks, and I go f I go from there. Um, yeah, that that that's my thoughts on that. Yes, Susan. Um, blue. I just did a segment for Patreon called Blueprints of Clawhammer Banjo. They're organized um, by tags at the top of the screen. If you click on that, that'll take you to all the blueprints, and that will be super. Um, that'll be super helpful in the beginning. The boot camp starts on Monday. We start very, very slow on the first day and we go through it and uh, all week we have an hour session every day live for a week, seven days straight of hardcore uh, mechanic workout. It's in 3-4. That's why it's called the Infinite Waltz. All that information is on Patreon if you want to find out more about that. Uh, you guys are awesome. Awesome, Luke. I can't wait to see you at uh, the Infinite Waltz next week. And yes, uh, Banjo Blitz, it's all free. Do a search for Banjo Blitz. There are 52 lessons for free that take you from the very beginning of Clawhammer. Uh, at this point, they are look a little aged because the, I didn't have the technical know-how to make it look at least reasonably nice like it does tonight. So uh, yeah, the audio is also not as good as it is these days, but they still work. Um, and I'm working on putting those into a book. So, cause I, I like the idea of being able to learn and work on banjo outside of looking at a screen. So uh, I'm starting, I, I have started it a while ago, but I'm hopefully finishing it by the spring. And that'll be all announced through YouTube and, and Patreon. Uh, okay, so let's let's help Dustin. Let's help Dustin. Dustin is currently stuck sounding like I'm following the first claw hammer lesson. Okay, yep, I see this a lot, Dustin. You are not alone. And Dustin's second question, I want to move past the, that tight and beginner sound to sounding more. I'm sure it's mostly technique I need to work on, something you would likely go over in a private lesson. Yes, I do have a waiting list for private lessons. So if you want to get on that waiting list, you're going to have to email me or contact me through YouTube um, and get on the waiting list. It'll be a bit. Uh, but there's plenty of information, and I do a lot of this through Patreon. That's a way for folks to get access to me more directly. And, you know, if you're on Patreon and you ping me, it's a good topic for a live stream, or it may end up being the subject of an entire video. I think in the beginning, the beginner's biggest task is translating this to inner strings and learning a tune all with the double thumb pattern. Don't worry about drop thumb, don't worry about that stuff, keep it simple. 
Look, one uh, one of the things I notice with beginners over and over is they're they're working from arrangements that are way too difficult. Keep it simple. You can get a lot of amazing sounds and not beginner sounds, like gorgeous sounds from a simple double thumbing technique. <laughs> Nice and easy, keep it simple, keep it all double thumb. There were a couple drop thumbs in there. Uh, keep it with double thumbs and, and um, work on getting your inner strings to sound like your outer string. That translation is so difficult in the beginning. Look, you're not alone, Dustin. Claw hammer is a bit of a steep climb in the very beginning. Uh, I know a lot of these folks in the audience, I've seen them play. Some of the folks in the audience tonight are learning, they're beginning. Some of these folks are super advanced, amazing players in the audience tonight. They can, all of them, underscore this idea that those first few months of claw hammer wrestling with these techniques, it's super tricky. Be determined, keep practicing, and you will get it. You will get it. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. That is, okay, there is a fretless boot camp. I had to bump that to January. It's in the very beginning of January. Probably the first few days of January is when we're gonna start. I had to bump it because this, this fall got incredibly busy with fiddle hell and a bunch of uh, other things that I had on my plate. So um, next week's boot camp is in 3-4 and then January, Jan it's just a month away if you think about it, we'll be doing a fretless boot camp especially geared for fretless players. I'm really excited. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. It's mostly written, which I'm really excited about too. Uh, I just have to work out a few bugs in the last line and then we'll be good to go. Uh, da, da. Uh, when will boot camp start on Monday? I'm gonna post that schedule tonight on Patreon just to give you guys a heads up. I have us, we're starting at 7 p.m. Eastern on Monday for the start of boot camp. That will be live streamed to the public. So if you want a taste of boot camp, you guys out there in the audience, if you want a taste of boot camp, uh, it will be uh, streamed from my channel for everybody. And then the rest of boot camp is for paid subscribers. So you can get a little taste. Um, I'll be posting the schedule soon. I'm really excited for it. It's really going to be fun in 3 4. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you. Yes, ah, yes, it can, it, this, this, these injuries can be tough, can be tough. All right. Yes, quickly, this is a, this is a question I'm gonna end on. Thank you guys for sticking with me till the bitter end. Uh, double thumbing is simply doing a downstroke and doing an upstroke on the fifth string. So that thumb stays on the fifth string after every downstroke. Drop thumb is different, but rhythmically identical, just to confuse you. Drop thumb is simply dropping the thumb down to a string that isn't the fifth string. But if you'll notice, it's rhythmically the same. So if I play you a one and two and three and four and pattern, and then play a drop thumb pattern, one and two and three and four, they're both eighth note patterns. It's just that with the drop thumb, I'm dropping my thumb to an inner string. I think for beginners, your best bet is to stay on double thumbing, get that working, get the throw working really well, then introduce the drop thumb. I usually introduce the drop thumb pretty darn early for most of my students. Uh, so, um, don't, I, I wouldn't wait on it. Don't let it be a spooky technique that's going to freak you out. I thought it was hard at first because I heard a bunch of interviews with famous players who said it were really, was really hard. So I avoided it like the plague, finally tried to do it and it was not that hard. So don't avoid drop thumb, but in the beginning, I'm a huge advocate of just make it simple for yourself. Keep it simple, 
master those basics, and recognize that you can play amazing music, beautiful music with just a double thumbing pattern. As long as the arrangement is good, as long as your mechanics are sound and you're keeping good time, there's nothing, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Clawhammer banjo is so beautiful that you can just kind of rely on it like a steadfast oak tree to make your music beautiful. Thank you, Eric. It's, I'm happy to have you. I'm happy to have you uh, in, in the crew. All right, guys, that does it for me. I'm going to go have some dinner. And then I'll probably play some more banjo later this evening. <laughs> doesn't get old. It just doesn't get old. All right. And look on YouTube. Subscribe below if you haven't. That's free. And then you'll be alerted to when, ring the little bell. The bell icon. Isn't that what all the YouTubers tell people to do? Ring that little bell icon. Touch the bell thing down below. That'll alert you to when I have videos coming up. I'm going to do this since there were so many of you guys and you're so engaged and interested. This was super fun. I'm going to keep doing these little beginner corners and we'll work on uh, inner strings next time. We'll also talk about the thumb stroke. It's a very overlooked part of claw hammer. There isn't much written about it and it's 50% of what you do. So it makes sense that you'd want it to be really good. I'll tell you my secrets of getting good thumb strokes, up strokes. And uh, yeah, that that's it. That's it. So nice to see you guys. Bye, guys, from around the world. It's so nice to hear from folks around the world who are playing claw hammer. I am going to fade out, fade out, and then I'll stay in chat for just a few minutes, and then I'll end the stream. Thank you.